understandable. Uh, good afternoon, Bill for Spiegelenberg. Um, Apache Unicorn is scheduled plugin for batch workloads. I was supposed to be here with my colleague, Craig, uh, but he's stuck in the US with some personal things that he needed to take care of. So it's just me here for today. Um, Apache Unicorn is this, uh, we've just announced that we've graduated to a top level project on Apache. Um, that came out yesterday, so that's a, a big thing to hear. Um, we'll go in and, and we'll dive into um, what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to look at uh, why we're doing Apache Unicorn, what's, uh, why did we design it, why are we running it, why do we need this or why do we want this for the batch workloads. And then we'll, we'll dive into a bit of the architecture. Um, we've been around for about four years, three and a half years, um, which was before the plugin framework was there. So we, we come from an old architecture into the new plugin framework architecture. And then we'll have a, a short demo and I'll hope that I've got some time left over at the end for, for questions. Um, and if not, then we'll sort of things out along the way. So the plugin framework um, is only just released in, in 1.0, so it's in tech preview at the moment, and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Uh, this must start sounding familiar by now. Um, all the talks that we've had today are talking about big data workload, batch workloads, needs to be different, it, it doesn't work like services on, on Kubernetes. So from perspective where we, come, where we came from, we're coming out of the, the yarn in the Mesos world, um, we look at pods or, or, or applications that get scheduled that have got a number of different pieces and they belong together. It's a logical grouping, it's not so specific for anything that we do together. Not all workloads are equal. Um, sometimes you've got things that you want to be first in, first out. Financial data, you first want to process the data from yesterday before you do today's. That's the, the first in, first out. But if you've got interactive sets of data, you want to do that fair sharing. You want to make sure that everybody gets their resources and everybody goes through the way that they have submitted things. The other thing is that we, if you look at batch workloads, you want to do queuing. It's, it's been mentioned by everybody you want to do some queuing. You don't want to have something external needed to be, need to resubmit a task if it doesn't fit within the quota. You want to hold on to it, and you want to schedule it later and just go through with all of that. Um, workload queuing also because of the fact that your demand is not constant. Often jobs run during the nights, during the evenings, for, for the, the standard batches that get run, but the interactive workloads that will run more during the day. You've got completely different uh, demands on your cluster during the things, during the time. You want to just postpone certain workloads, you want to hold on to them and you want to kick them off whenever um, you want to. So, why Apache Unicorn? So we looked at the, what the default scheduler did and what we, had as a demand from, from the customers and what we were doing on a yarn and a Mesos kind of thing. So in the default schedule, we don't have a, an, an application concept. You can't just say group all these things together and run this as, as one thing. Schedule them, fit them in resources, do whatever you need to do. The scheduling algorithm is also limited. We've got one queue, we sort the queue, it's based on the pods that are there, and then if we've sorted all those pods, we're going to run them. But the queue that we've got is one queue for the whole cluster. And I can have multiple types of workloads running at the same point in time. So I really would like to have multiple types of sorting algorithms. For instance, one namespace will run with the first in, first out. The other one will do fair sharing or priority-based queuing. So that's, uh, that's the other part. Limits and quotas, resource quotas, are not part of the scheduler on, on standard Kubernetes. You enforce them before you submit things. So somebody comes up and says, I want to run this batch job. Oh, there's no resources available. Oh, now I need to come back and retry to submit that same kind of job again. 
and again, up until they've got the resources available. So that's a, a problem. The quote that's because they're hard enforced, don't allow me to do any of the queuing. So what do we do with Apache Unicorn? So we've got a different approach. We, ba we schedule based on applications. Whatever you decide is an application, we'll group together and we'll schedule that as part of one application. That can be anything from uh, one pod or thousands of pods and pods that are created dynamically or pods that are submitted all in one go. So you decide on what, what to do there. We create a hierarchical queue system. So we've, we set up a queue on a route, queues underneath, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And we enforce the quotas in that hierarchical queue system. Later on, we'll look a bit more on, on how we do that and what, what that gives us uh, and, and what the, the real um, extras get that we get out of that. We can do, in that hierarchical queue system, we can do flexible quota distribution. So I saw that in one of the other presentations coming back too. It's quota sharing. I think it was in Volcano. that uh, a group is using only half of their quota. Another group within the same team wants to use more. So we can now share that quota. Flexible quota sharing and flexible quota distributions we can set up in that hierarchical queue system. We've also got configuration, uh, configuration for our sorting policies. So instead of having a pot sorting policy that runs out of one queue, we can sort at different levels. We can sort the queues, which queue needs to be first, which one needs to be later, um, how do you distribute your quotas between the queues, and then we can also look at application uh, sorting. So do you want to do priorities, first in, first out, fair sharing, and all these things can be set up per queue. So I've got the possibility to have queues that are doing fair sharing, queues that are doing FIFO, based on the applications again. And then the last but not least, we've got the, the node sorting also. The area where we come from, we've got customers that want to run either in the cloud or on-premise. And on-premise, you've got a static cluster. You don't scale up, you don't scale down, or at least most people don't. Um, so that means that you, you want to be able to sort your nodes differently. In the cloud, you want to pack everything together, make sure that you get your cost under control, pack all the pods that you've got on one node, you do bin packing, and in an on-premise cluster, you want to spread everything out as much as possible so you can use as much of the CPU that you've got available and do bursting and all that kind of stuff. All right. there's, an, there's also a couple of other things that we come up with and a bit more advanced scheduling requirements. So Apache Spark has been used a number of times and, and as an example. So if you look at advanced scheduling, we've got the gang scheduling. You want to create an application but you don't know beforehand how much it's going to use, but you want to give it a certain set of resources. So you specify on the Spark application or on any application what kind of gang resource you want to use. You can have multiple gang definitions, so multiple pod types, multiple combinations of things. And we only start scheduling based on the resources that are available. So the other thing that comes up in the gang scheduling, and somebody mentioned that as SLA scheduling, I think it was called, is the soft and hard scheduling the, for the gang. If you say, oh, after five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't care if I don't have all my gang resources available, I want to start the job anyway, then you can say, okay, let's go and schedule and then we'll figure out where the rest of the resources come from. In other cases, you want to say, oh, no, no, I really need all these resources. If I don't get them, stop the application, just fail it, and let's go on. But that's over. All those combinations are possible, and we can set up all of that stuff for you. Now, look at the, the application sorting again. We sort per queue. 
multiple applications are there. If they are streaming applications, that could be a Spark application. A Spark application could also be an SQL query that, you, that somebody wants to run, wants to have a direct output. So depending on where we run, depending on what we do, we can do the different sorts in there. And the third point was the, 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 the node sorting. Bin packing, fair sharing, whatever you want to do. Top one, the bin packing, private uh, is in the, the public clouds, AWS, uh, Google, what, whatever you want to run. The bottom, you run your private cloud, you share, you burst your, your, your containers. All these are available. Application sorting, gang scheduling, all that kind of stuff. You can set up different queues, different things. You can do whatever you want. But there's only one node sorting policy allowed for the cluster because there's, there's no way that you can sort nodes in a different way because you share all the nodes on, on one thing. Yeah. In the previous slides, I stepped really quickly over what the possibilities we've had in, in uh, the hierarchical queue system. So let's, let's dive in a little bit more in, into the hierarchical queue system. I'm going to take a really simple example. Uh, you can make it as, as difficult as possible. Um, again, we're coming from the, from the yarn perspective. We've had customers that are, that are running with hundreds of queues in, in, in five, six levels deep with all kinds of different combinations, all kinds of different setups. Again, all that stuff is also possible within Unicorn, but that's not something that I want to go in too deeply in around here. So we take a, a simple setup, root queue, with underneath that one tenant queue, and we're going to schedule from, from that. At a namespace, in, in Kubernetes level, we create three namespaces. We've got an unlimited and a limited namespace. Those two namespaces will be scheduled completely according to the unicorn logic and whatever we want to do with application sorting and all that kind of stuff. We've got a non-unicorn namespace also sitting beside that. That one is not going to be scheduled by unicorn because we're running as a plugin. We're running as an extension of the default scheduler. So what we say is those two namespaces, unlimited and limited, those will follow unicorn and whatever you want to do and whatever you set up for the non-unicorn namespace, we don't care. We don't touch it. It just goes through the logic that the default scheduler does with whatever you've set up there. Now, in all these namespaces, we run an X number of pods. The pods underneath the non-unicorn namespace are just separate pods. They get handled like that. The pods under the unicorn namespaces will be handled as logical groupings of in an application. The root has got a dynamic resource quota. It's the, the total size of the cluster. Whenever you register a new node, it gets picked up, the root gets adjusted, quota grows, quota, quota shrinks based on what is available in, in the cluster. Um, that's also important because we need that quota a little bit later on when we go in and do the next step. Because the non-unicorn namespace that we've created does not have a quota within unicorn, but it still uses nodes and an and, 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 and amount of resources in the cluster. So whatever is being used in non-unicorn namespace will be deducted from the root quota that Unicorn knows how to handle. So we don't use the quota that is set on the non-unicorn names, but we use the real usage that is there. So we track the ports and we deduct that from whatever is there. So again, that makes the quota at the root level dynamically adjusted. And then within Unicorn, we can set different quotas on different queues. In this case, we've set a resource limit, as an example, on the tenant queue of 75 gigabytes, 75 CPUs. Whatever you want to set is fine. We've 
limited, the limited queue also to a 50 gigabyte and a 50 CPU. So because limited corresponds to a namespace, that namespace or the ports that will run, be running in the namespace will be limited by Unicorn to that 50 gigabyte. Unlimited does not have a quota set directly on it, but the parent of unlimited is, is the tenant queue. So what happens is that when we try to schedule things in the unlimited queue, we're not only checking does this queue have a limit, but we also look up to the parent and the parent of the parent just to make sure that we keep track of that quota that is there. So we do a recursive check. So effectively in the unlimited queue, we've got a 75 gigabyte, 75 CPU limit set. However, checking the, the parents and the, and, the, and the interaction at the different levels is a bit more complex because what happens is that the usage within the tenant queue is really the sum of all the queues that are below the tenant queue. So whatever resources are used in unlimited and limited get combined as resource usage in the tenant queue. So if I use 50 gigabyte in limited, then really effectively unlimited can use another 25 gigabyte. How we share that 75 gigabyte limit from the tenant over these two queues depends on the sorting algorithm that I've set between the two queues. So if I do fair sharing, that means that based on the amount of quota that I've got, I get it nicely distributed over the two queues. If there's no load running in unlimited, limited will be able to pick up the 50 gigabyte at the maximum and gets limited at that point there. So, so again, looking at all these different ways of, of configuring things, we've got different queue sorting algorithms that we can set up. We can do the pods, the applications within the unlimited queue as a FIFO setup while we do fair sharing in the limited queue. Combinations are endless. You can set up whatever you want. Um, then we'll, we'll go and have a little bit of a look at the architecture. How, so what did we do? How did we, we, we get where we are here for, for this architecture? So when we started, the, 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 the system that was available was no extensions on the default scheduler. We couldn't do anything. There was no plugin framework. The extenders were probably still <laughs> a little bit in development, um, but that was abandoned halfway through. So we really didn't have an, any, any options. So what we did is we built a simple architecture based on um, a, plug, a, a plugin, a shim and a, and a core scheduler. So because we came out of the yarn world, uh, we thought we've got multiple resource managers, Mesos, yarn, Kubernetes, all these kind of things. So we want to be able to run the scheduler on top of whatever resource manager is there. So what we decided was we built a core that does all the scheduling stuff. So that handles the queues, that handles the quota checks, that does all the things that we want to do of enforcing all that stuff. And we've got a shim that runs below that, that hides all the resource manager um, specific things for it. So the Unicorn core doesn't really understand what a pod is. It doesn't know what it is. It, it just knows I've got a resource request. It has got an allocation that I need to schedule. So we can remove the Kubernetes shim and we can put a yarn shim in, in place or a Mesos shim in place that does the same thing. The Kubernetes shim talks to the API server and it converts whatever the API server gives in pods into what we understand in the core as applications and all that kind of stuff. So this was the design that we had uh, when we started about three, three and a half years ago. This is what we've implemented. Um, over the time that we were running, the plugin framework became mature and we, sta we started using it. So how did we change 
our design from what was here, implementing the whole scheduler, doing all the things that the default scheduler did, to something a little bit more in line with the plugin framework. So what we did is we pulled apart the shim. So we replaced all the things that we did within the shim with the plugin framework. So we integrated instead of our own code for, for handling the default, for handling the binding of the pods and all that kind of stuff, we replaced that with using the plugin framework and letting the default scheduler handle all those things for us. So the Unicorn core hasn't changed. It's exactly the same as it was before. We just replaced a part of our shim with callouts and the plugin integration. So in the current version that we've got, we provide you with both options. So you can run the old model or you can run the new model. Both work and both are generated from the same code. It's just a different Docker image that we provide for you for running it. So the plugin architecture. For people that have looked at the scheduler and have looked at the ex extending the scheduler before, this is a, a familiar uh, picture. So we're there. We started using that. So what have we done? What 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 have we implemented? So we we've picked up uh, at the point that we we started to pick up the, the pre-filter. In the pre-filter, what we do is we pick out the pods that. Unicorn needs to handle. So everything that belongs to either namespaces or things like that we want to manage as Unicorn through the Unicorn uh, code, we pick those out and we, we handle them. Anything else, we just let go. We don't, we, we don't bother with it. We just let the pre-filter say, yep, it's all fine. Go and do your thing. The pre-filter ones, we filter out whatever we want to do. So at that point, we, we get the pre-filter and release whatever has passed. So anything that passes through the pre-filter and what needs to be handled by Unicorn has passed the internal quota checks for, for Unicorn. We know that we are in the, in the right state. Um, so we've, we know that it's an application. The application should be running. So it, it runs within the queue because not only can we limit things on resources, but we can also say, oh, you can only run 10 applications in that queue. So we know that that application is running and that we need to assign pods to them and it fits within the quota. So after the pre-filter has passed, the default scheduler will start looking for a node and assign a node to the, uh, to the pod. Unicorn, the core scheduler does the same. We look at the node and we, we also do that. In the, in the filter, those two things come together. So the default scheduler says, I've got a node, for it is running this pod, and we keep on rejecting the node up until we say, oh no, this is the node that we have now decided, Unicorn has decided that this pod needs to run on. And then we say, yep, all, all okay, and we release, um, we release the pod. At that point, we let the default scheduler take over. It will do all the rest of the things um, and go through all the, all the stuff up until we get to the post bind. So what we do is internally within the shim, we have our own accounting and our own tracking and our own uh, filtering and our logging things. And up until we get to the post bind, we say we, we, we are stopped. We've got uh, nothing to do. Post bind will update our tracking. Now, for this, um, we've got a a short demo that, that will show you uh, two sets of pods that we do. We've got a set of pods that will be tracked by Unicorn and a set of pods that won't be tracked by Unicorn. And we'll, we'll show you slightly and in a quick overview in a, in a two minute demo what, how that looks from the front end. And I hope that the sound works. And now for a short demo of Unicorn's new plugin interface. We first create two namespaces, each having a quota of one CPU and one gigabyte of RAM. However, Unicorn has been configured so that namespace two 
will utilize the internal default scheduling logic rather than the queuing logic that Unicorn normally uses. Now we create three sleep pods in the first namespace. There is only room for two of these to run given our queue settings. So when we list the pods out, we can see here that in fact only two of the pods have been approved for scheduling and the third remains in a pending status. We can also see that a scheduler name has been set of Unicorn and a default generated application ID has been assigned to these pods. We can also check the web interface and see that in fact a queue has been created automatically for this application. It is in a running state and two of the pods are active. Now we can clean up our pods so that we can create them in our second namespace. Now we create three pods in our second namespace. This namespace has been configured to bypass Unicorn queuing and so all three pods will be allowed to start at the same time, and we can see that here. We can also see that Unicorn has been assigned as the scheduler, so we haven't completely bypassed Unicorn. However, we have not associated an application ID or a queue to these pods. We can see this in the web interface by the fact that there is no queue for namespace 2. Thank you for watching our demo. Have a great day. So that was done by Craig. Um, who couldn't be here today. So what we saw here is we pick up the pods, we schedule a part of them through Unicorn, and a part of them we don't. Um, in summary, so what we've, what we've done, um, the community, we've released 1.0 with a tech preview of, uh, of this. We're still missing a number of things, scale and performance testing we haven't done yet. Um, we started working with other communities. Uh, Apache Spark was already named by the Volcano uh, guys. We're working with them on the same uh, Spark Jira to get things going. Uh, with SIG scheduling, we're trying to integrate with them also and do a little bit more. We've got some uh, improvement in some future work that we, we want to do. Um, the pre-filter gives us a lot of unscheduled pods, which affects our auto-scaling badly. Um, there's a pre and queue hook that just popped up about two weeks ago or so, a week and a half ago. That is looking like a really good solution for what we do with batch scheduling uh, for us. Um, the other thing is that we've got a problem, uh, something that we need to look at is with the auto-scaler, with the impact of the out of quota pots on the on the auto scaler so that is really limited to what we do um, if you don't use the auto scaler we don't have that problem so uh, okay and then I think we've got some time left over for q and a I don't know how it, how good I am for time Uh, can you handle um, GPU resources? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. So um, from, a, from a scheduling perspective, from the core perspective, we are um, resource agnostic. So whatever you define as a resource, if, even if you say I want to uh, schedule pods that, that use a resource called license, we don't care. You can schedule whatever you want. So we do, if, if you can define it on the pod, and you can define it uh, anywhere else, we can schedule on that and we can see it as a resource. Yeah. Um, just from your experience, do you find hierarchy, like you mentioned that there are some customers using deep hierarchy, do you think that was a good idea? Do you think that they are being abused? Uh, maybe we should, for example, force them not to do that because I imagine it could be really hard to reason about that. You say six, seven levels, that's it's like, yes, I yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so yes, that I those Q hierarchies are really difficult to talk about and really difficult to understand. But the companies that use them, they, what they do, they've got a logical grouping of that. So let's say you've got a, a, a multinational that says, I've got uh, the company as the top level, then US as uh, the second level um, and other regions around the world as the second level, then within that, so you go down, so they've got a really logical setup for that, and they spread and do things around that in, in that way. So, yeah, it's it's unbelievably hard to troubleshoot and, and to, to understand, but yeah, there, there's, there's a logical solution for, for, for customers.
Thank you, Wilfred. Um, I hope you stay around for more questions. Uh, I'll, I'll be yes. around for more questions without a problem.